what we're going to do is look at some of the aquatic life inside and on the pond. So we've looked specifically at amphibians and we looked at bats and we're going to look at dragonflies and damselflies and we're trying to get some idea of what these ponds are about and how they're functioning. And this will help then guide future management, that's the idea, because the ponds we think are not in very good condition. We're not sure what the reason is. Now the water coming in, because we're quite, quite close to the upland moors and bogs, should be quite acidic, but we also here have runoff from farmland at the top of the valley. <clears throat> so it's possible that that might be affecting the, uh, the condition of the pond. And we've also got uh, iron ochre discharges, which we'll see in the yeah. goit between the two ponds. There's a huge area of sort of orangey gunk that comes out, which is iron ochre. And this is generally it's common in the coal measures, but it's particularly common where there have been previous coal mines or ironstone mines, as we've got here. Both we've got both. And water, when it goes underground, becomes deoxygenated. That means it can dissolve iron oxide, but it's in a soluble form. When the water comes out into the um, open again, into the air, it absorbs oxygen and it gets converted to a different iron oxide, which is rust. So that causes that horrible orangey ochreous deposition. So, you know, we know that's happening, but that's quite localised. The other big factor appears to be runoff of silt and sediment which may be affecting the ponds and that's probably been exacerbated at least in the short term by the management that's happened up at rough stand hills in the upper part of the valley. So there's a whole set of things happening. The other one is of course we're in a created landscape from about the early 1900s. It's been planted with lots and lots of trees, native and ornamental. And of course, come the autumn, they drop lots of leaves into the ponds. So you're losing light into the pond, but you're also actually gaining a lot of organic material. So these are things that we want to <coughs> try to get a handle on. We, we need to know more about the condition of the ponds and their ecological health. Now, in order to do that, and we'll talk more about this on site, we need to understand a bit more about what makes a pond ecosystem function. And the neat thing with a pond is it's a sort of entire ecological system in one discrete place, whereas most of the other stuff we're looking at is a bit fuzzy. You don't get a single entity that you can um, look at, study, evaluate. So the pond is a nice discrete unit, but even so there are different elements to it. And this is important in understanding what we would call the food chain or the food web, so the things that feed on what and the things that feed on each other within the pond system. Now there are basically <coughs> lots of uh, invertebrates, insects and crustaceans which are feeding on the sediment that I've already discussed. A lot of them live in the mud and the sediments. To do that you need to be able to cope with low levels of oxygen because all that silt, sediment and mud uses up oxygen when it's being broken down. So you're in what we call anaerobic or anoxic conditions. So you have to be quite specialised to live in that situation, but it does mean that you're sort of sat in a soup and if you're able to consume it, then you know, the world is your oyster. You can actually live there quite happily. But then you've got the structure of the pond, you've got the open water, you've got the marginal areas, which we'll see often with vegetation, fringing vegetation and muddy patches. And again, you know, muddy patches means that's somewhere that you can burrow into and you can hide away and you can uh, feed quite happily. You've then got the surface of the water, which is really important because of the way that water is chemically structured. It forms what we call a hydrogen bond and that creates on the surface because you've only got water on one side and you've got air on the other. For reasons I'll not go into at the moment, it forms what we call a meniscus, a, a surface layer, which if you're small enough and clever enough, you can actually walk on. So there's a whole set of uh, insects particularly that live on the water meniscus. So certain species tell us about pollution, which might be high levels of organic matter. Certain things tell us about 
um, better conditions, a richer food web, maybe higher levels of oxygen. One of the big differences, because freshwater ecologists tend to consider these as two different things. We look at running water, so streams and rivers, and we look at ponds, ponds and lakes. And the main difference is the level of oxygen in the two. Where you've got running water, you've got more oxygen because the water's bubbling along. Um, and that means certain species can survive. And oxygen is one of these things that favour some species. Um, and then if you haven't got oxygen, then other species that cope with low levels of oxygen do very well. So oxygen levels is a big differentiation between running water and still water. And then the other thing is the adaptation that you've got. But the idea is to build up a picture of what's actually happening in the ponds or potentially what isn't happening in the ponds and that can tell us about condition and therefore perhaps inform future management. Right, there are lots of online sources for identification and there's little things where you can submit a photograph and the, the um, app will try and tell you what it is. There are very nice little uh, guidance sheets from the Field Studies Council and from the Freshwater Biological Association. So you can find all these online. Now, in terms of accessible guides, as I say, there's lots and lots of stuff online and there's things that you can buy quite low cost. There are also things that are probably now out of print but are easily available um, on the second-hand book websites. This is the best one. I like this because it's titled The Young Specialist Looks At which I find quite comforting. There are Pond Life. That is probably the easiest and best little book still. Uh, very nicely illustrated. It's got most things that you're likely to find. It's quite reliable and it's got references to further reading, etc, etc. That is a really very good little book. And I bet you can get that for about 50 pence, The Young Specialist. The Bible was Freshwater Life by a man called John Clegg. And he was writing this way way back it's frederick war 1950s this was the post-war bible on freshwater life and those of us who got into uh, ponds and streams this is the definitive thing he also wrote the one that goes with it the potter version the observer's book this was a fantastic series when i was a kid really good this one has got lots and lots of really good information if you want to understand about these animals and plants this tells you a lot of the natural history, which the straightforward identification guides often don't give you. So again, those are easily available and highly recommended. The more current one is by Richard Fitter. And this is Collins Field Guide to Freshwater Life. Very comprehensive, lots and lots of um, easy to use keys and guidance notes and it covers everything from plants through to invertebrates, nicely illustrated. Now you can pretty much see the nature of the problem. Yeah. It's just a you know, really gunky, silty, organic mess. There's a few tadpoles in the water. There's almost nothing moving in that. And it's quite a fine sort of silty material. It's going to be very low in oxygen. So we've got a problem, basically. You know, there's almost, there's no, there's fringing vegetation. So if we just sort of search around in this material, we'd get some things. And you could see some pond skaters of some sort earlier. We're whizzing around in the middle. There's a lot of mosquito activity egg laying 
not sure which ones those are because not all the midges and mosquitoes are uh, uh, blood sucking so <laughs> they're not all bad again with the midges the it's the females with these things that are the the ones that are a problem because they they need to suck blood to get the nutrient to lay the eggs so that's why they're after you so the males which you sometimes see big swarms of males displaying to each other the females fly in and then mate with one with one or more of the males and drop to the floor and then they can go and do the egg laying but uh, the species that suck blood the reason that they're sucking blood it's the females exclusively and it's because they're needing that nutrient boost um, from a warm-blooded mammal. I mean, the, the damselflies and dragonflies can move over quite wide distances to find egg-laying sites and to find mates, so that's what they're doing. Um, they are potentially interesting because they are one of these markers of a, a better quality ecological system. They're top carnivores. So these are at the end of one of those food chains, which means there's got to be a food chain to feed on. And it's the larvae which are uh, living in the pond, and then the adults emerge um, from that. But as Christine says, you can get the adults prospecting, but without necessarily breeding. So when we're evaluating a pond, you're really looking for adults egg-laying, adults emerging, because when they come up, they often climb up a bit of vegetation they sit there and they pupate and then they hatch out and when they're doing that you can often get them in quite good numbers where the adults have recently hatched and they have to sit there and let the wings stretch out and the body harden so those, those are then good indicators of the the condition and you can actually count what we call the exuvi which are the hardened body cases from which they've emerged but the other thing is actually finding the larvae in the pond which is you know obviously there that's a marker for the quality of the pond simply having a dragonfly attracted to the shiny water surface doesn't really mean that much it's interesting but it's not telling us much about the actual water quality so what we're looking for really are larvae in the pond itself really voracious larvae that we get in here um, are the carnivorous water beetles, the, di the Dytiscidae. Um, and again, I mean, they, they might be here because we've got tadpoles and they will eat tadpoles. But they are big beetles, some of the, uh, the smaller Dytiscus, but the great carnivorous water beetles are about so long and about so wide. And they fly usually at night between water bodies and they will drop down where there's light, say reflecting from the moon, onto a pond surface. So they drop down and then they're after anything. Uh, the larvae of the dragonflies is a bit like the, the jaw parts from the film Alien. I think that's what it was based on. They've got bits that come out underneath and, you know, it's really quite vicious. The Dytiscus are a bit more basic. They just have great big biting pincers with kind of grooves in them and they just impale their prey which can be small fish uh, or tadpoles or larger invertebrates so they are really quite voracious predators um, quite a number of um, carnivorous water beetles the, the big carnivorous water beetles come to grief because they actually land on people's greenhouse roofs at night so they see moonlight reflect off the glass and they think it's water so they drop down from, you know, 100 foot up or something and get more than a headache. <laughs> OK, let's go and have a, a look at the next pond. OK, we're on the, the section between the two ponds now. So we've got the big pond down here that we've just been looking at. We've got the small pond slightly higher up. And then you've got the tiny pond. Yeah. And then we've got the little pond above. Again, this is very, very peculiar. We've got a, an iron ochre um, input to the side here. You can see that orangey colour. And it's actually oozing out from the bank of the channel. So water is moving under the ground here and coming out there. If you go to the other side of the footpath, the main path, 
and then drop down towards the edge of the wood, it's sopping wet. Yeah. So again, there's a spring line there. So I would guess there's maybe a layer of shale. We need to look at the geology. We've got this material losing out that either could be a natural influx from iron rich deposits or it could be linked to uh, coal mine addicts or other features. It's a, this, historically it's been quite an industrial little valley. So that's not a total surprise but it does have implications for, um, for water quality shall we say and certainly visual quality. Now the other issue here, we've already talked about it with the main site, is water. We just had absolutely torrential rain, where's the water gone? Because it's not in here. Now there is a drain which comes down the side here, so is that hijacking the water from here into that and away? That's a possibility, in which case that's something that can be addressed. because. It's a small catchment, you want as much water as you can coming into here. The main catchment is the Lim Brook, which runs down separate from here. So we're not getting any water from that part of the Lim Valley. We're just getting water from this side here by the hole. So that might be one of the issues. Are we just not getting the water flow? Can we get some water from over there, get it into here? Now the other thing here is that we have got that fine deposit. I don't know if you're able to see that, Chris. You can see me disturbing the silt there, but we've got more obvious organic material here. But look at that, I mean, my God. stuff in there. Well, the other thing to notice is it's quite black. That's usually a sign of it being anaerobic. So we will have a look. There should be some stuff. So you can see it's very black. A lot of this stuff is just not breaking down. There's very little sign of ecological activity. I would normally expect something like that, they fished out of a, a good water body to be crawling with invertebrates. You can smell it, it's anaerobic, it's not terribly good. And there's nothing, there's not even, there's not even any worms. There's no larvae of anything. I mean, all the things that we would hope in here, um, all the insects that are emergent either in the water or around the water, you'd expect to find, find their larvae. And there's pretty much nothing in there. I can't even see any what we call microarthropods, a little um, Daphnia and Cyclops that the other things would be eating. So why is it not breaking down? I think because there's nothing in it. Um, For it to break down you need things like snails and worms and stuff like that. So there's something, you know, there's absolutely nothing in there. And we can see that Chris, that is really quite unpleasant stuff. If that were my pond at home it would be crawling with all sorts of things scurrying about and we're not seeing anything. So that I think is a problem and I would also say that this bit, this particular section is a problem that could be renovated quite quickly because you're not having an impact, you've got easy access and the material could just be dumped on the side there. It's, it's smelly but it'll rot down once it gets air to it. It's only organic material, it's not got something, well we don't think it's got anything toxic in it. The only reason it's toxic is it's got no oxygen. So if you put this stuff into a clean river, then it causes a, a nasty pollution incident. So, it, you know, it's all a matter of context. So I'm just going to take a, and I get an idea of how deep this might be, because that's what we need to be removing. It's quite deep. It's very deep. So I'd say about a metre. And that needs removing. 